diagnosis with breast cancer. Um, she's doing amazingly well now. It's been a wonderful success story. But like many Pittsburghers, it was my wake up call that I wanted to be closer to my family. So that's what brought me back here. I attended law school at the University of Pittsburgh. And shortly after starting to practice law, I realized having lived in other cities um, and seeing all of the great things about Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, I really wanted to be involved in public service. And I always approached it with the attitude that I couldn't fix anything, everything. <laughs> I hope I can fix something. <laughs> but um, you know, many go into it um, believing that we can change the world and we want to have that attitude. But I knew I could make some difference. And I really wanted to be able to use my voice in that way. And I wanted to share with you all, because often when I come to Sewickley, many people remember my uncle, Jack Wagner, who was your state senator here for many years and later auditor general, and has certainly, for me as controller, been an inspiration and given me a lot of advice. But he talked about one of the first times that he ran for office. Uh, and what got him into office many years ago was a water crisis in the same neighborhood where I grew up, uh, in Beachview. And he started running and he said he'll never forget what an older woman said to him as to why she wanted to support him. And she said, I see you um, like I think of my washing machine. And he was a little bit confused as to why that analogy. And she said, of course you need uh, your detergent and you need it to work, but you need an agitator. And she saw him as an agitator who was asking the right questions in government. And I always say I'm biased because I adore my Uncle Jack, but he really, I believe, represented that in government. Um, to this day, he's still doing a lot of work for veterans and continues to be committed to public service. But that's an approach that I've taken. I think that we have to be really mindful, especially in today's age, where we don't have as much media scrutiny on civic matters. And that's unfortunate nationally, and it's certainly unfortunate locally. And I'm really appreciative of all of you being interested in county government, because I will tell you, uh, one of the disappointments that I've learned along the way is that people are often focusing on the city of Pittsburgh, and they forget that the expenditures and, in many ways, the responsibilities of our county government go very far beyond that. Um, so I think that, especially as I said, in this era we, where we don't have as much reporting on local matters, it's so important for us to really pay attention to ask the tough questions. Um, so my approach to service uh, has been a saying that my husband learned from a political mentor is to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's been true, I believe, in my uh, public service career, but you really need that in the position of controller. Because while many people will ask, unlike my son, what does a controller do? Uh, and I know many of you have you know, really deep and interesting backgrounds, and you certainly understand that, but the average person usually doesn't. And so the best description is that you're the fiscal watchdog. To some people, when I say that you're the chief financial officer, that alone doesn't give it justice because the independence of the office is so important. And when we think of the major corporate scandals that we've had in this country and beyond, I always think that if you had somehow independence in those internal fiscal oversight roles, uh, really the role and responsibility of the boards, you know, you might not have had um, some of those terrible outcomes. So I'm very fortunate to have a um, really great staff, uh, and I believe that I can't do any of that without them, um, and people who are really committed to their service in government. So I'll jump ahead to the next slide here. Um, this slide here, and I'm gonna read it for you because I know it's hard to see, it talks about specifically the powers of the Allegheny County Controller. And all of our, or most I should say, of the laws governing county government are pretty archaic. <laughs> and so, um, 
um, you know, they were codified a long time ago in state law. And so for the powers of the controller coming from um, our state law, as an independently elected row office of Allegheny County, and I will pause there for a second because the row offices that we have, they've declined over the years, and I'll talk about that, but currently it's the treasurer, the controller, the district attorney, and the sheriff. And Amy is somebody who's been in county government. I may have asked you this question, Amy, but when I got to the courthouse, one of my questions was, why are they called the row, R-O-W, offices? And in county government, it's because the offices were in a row. <laughs> Nothing exciting, pretty simple and straightforward. Um, but so as an independently elected row office of Allegheny County, the controller is charged with the general supervision and control of the fiscal affairs of the county, including oversight of all of the county contracts, assets, and purchases. So when we're talking about a budget in excess of two billion, those are pretty broad responsibilities. The controller scrutinizes, audits, and decides on all bills, claims, and demands against the county. And the controller uniquely does have the power of subpoena um, for those whose accounts are under audit by the county. And then lastly on this slide, the controller may administer oaths and affirmations to anyone appearing before them, and those appearing before the county controller are subject to perjury charges. So those are things that we don't see in action as much um, in the kind of current era communicated to uh, companies that have contracts with the county that weren't in compliance and weren't providing proper information and that's something that happens pretty frequently. Um, let me just give you a little bit of an idea because we don't have it specifically in this presentation but I want to give you a little bit of a information on the organization of the controller's office. So when you think of county government, our county government in Allegheny County has almost 7,000 employees across all of the different divisions, and I'll mention those divisions a little bit later. Within the controller's office, we have about 100 employees. That fluctuates some. Um, now it's probably closer to about 85 with some interns and so forth. Um, but we have three major divisions in the controller's office. The one most people know about is the audit division. Uh, and I say in a business sense, it's because it's the sexiest division. It's what you hear about. It's what you hear about in the news, um, whether we are looking at something with the health department or we're looking at public works, that's what you hear about. Our largest division, though, is our accounting division, going to the scrutiny of all of the financial matters of the county. So roughly 45 members of our staff fall into that accounting division. We also have a very important IT division. Um, and so uniquely, and this is something that Pittsburgh and Allegheny County has been proud of, uh, and is unique when you compare us to other places in the country, we have run a joint financial management system between Allegheny County and the city of Pittsburgh, uh, which has been one of those good points uh, of cooperation. Unfortunately, and it has nothing to do with the great work that the county has done and the city controller, Michael Lamb's office, um, the current mayor of Pittsburgh, Peduto, made a decision to withdraw from that just this year. So that, we believed, was really unfortunate because it was one of the few areas where we had achieved consolidation um, and better cost efficiencies. So those are the three major divisions um, of the controller's office. A really important part to mention when we're talking about our audit division is our ability to uh, react quickly. And when I took this office, I went back and I asked um, all the recent predecessors of this office, including Frank Lucchino, who many of you will remember, who held this office for the longest time, for about 20 years before he became a judge, um, to Mark Flaherty, my immediate predecessor, and then Dan Honorado. And the feedback I got from most of them 
was that you want to be nimble enough. So if there is a major um, crisis or a major issue in the county, you want to be able to mobilize your team to be able to look at it more quickly. Um, and I took that to heart and I believe that we've really been able to do that. And to give you a couple examples that I find to be the most important that we've been able to work on, in some ways out of the box, but ways that I think impact all county residents, um, probably biggest was in the last couple of years, and that's the healthcare debacle, where you had Highmark and UPMC um, threatening to deny access to the hospitals, and I always say it's the hospitals that our taxpayers have built. So being able to um, mobilize the resources of our office and go out in the public and get stories of individuals who were being directly impacted. Uh, in that example, we know that the audit, or rather the Attorney General, uh, Josh Shapiro, was able to use all of that data and information directly to broker the agreement um, that stopped that real crisis from happening where you'd have people having to pick one or the other. Still not perfect, but I think it was one of those areas where we were able to make progress. Um, certainly all of our financial audits are critically important, but when you look at the sophistication of organizations, um, both private and government of these days, um, we really need to be able to not just look at was the money spent where somebody said it was going to be spent. We need to look at for the taxpayers whether these are the right decisions to be able to compare benchmarks across the country and see if, for example, we're investing appropriately to make sure that our drinking water is safe uh, or to make sure that our air quality is safe. So that's a really important part of the controller's office spacebar. Uh, this is pretty difficult to see, but it just gives you an overview of county government. And as I said, we have those four different independent row offices, um, but our county government um, mainly falls under the county executive, other than those separate offices. And within that, you have uh, a county manager. And I'll detail this in a little, but roughly around 2000, as many of you will remember, Allegheny County went to what is called home rule charter. So uh, previously, you had the three commissioner system, and Allegheny County transitioned to having a chief executive, an appointed county manager, and then a council. I will say that I don't think we did it in all the right way because I think having a council that is um, essentially more of a volunteer position with not enough staff does not give that body enough um, ability to do the difficult checks and balances that we needed to do, and that's no knock on any of those individuals. I think they all serve, um, you know, and they're very committed, but I think we could do better uh, in terms of an organizational structure. Um, so in terms of the county government, um, you have the judicial branch, the legislative branch, and that executive branch. And so under this form of government, um, with especially not having such a strong setup of the legislative branch, you really have a tremendous amount of power and authority that falls under that executive branch. I wanted to touch on fragmentation because you can't talk about Allegheny County government with recognizing uh, really how terribly fragmented um, our government is in Allegheny County as compared to others. Um, so Allegheny County is what is called under Pennsylvania law a second class county. Uh, and that just refers to the size of our population. Uh, by memory, I think we go all the way down to eight, eight class, eight classes <laughs> across Pennsylvania. Um, but when you look at um, the county, you see that we have 130 municipalities. We are second only to Luzerne, or I'm sorry, um, Luzerne County. I'm getting mixed up in my slides here. Luzerne is the only one close to us, and it has roughly 90 different municipalities. Now, I think being here in Sewickley, you all know there is great 
um, charm and there's great assets in our individual communities. But then what in turn we lose is a lot of those cost efficiencies and figuring out ways that um, our residents aren't overtaxed and seeing different duplications within government. So looking back just to the history of Allegheny County, I have a few different slides in here which I don't want to just read over to be uh, too boring for everybody, but it has long been a subject, including when Allegheny County adopted this home rule charter, and it started in 1996, um, but came to reality around 2000, and they specifically stated that as a region, we cannot afford, nor do taxpayers expect to pay for unnecessary and duplicative public services. Um, so it goes on how that was one of the objectives of when Allegheny County changed its form of government. Now I can tell you, unfortunately, um, I think rhetorically that's a lot easier to say than actually getting it done. So oftentimes, just like any organization, you see, and I believe county government even more so, to be pretty adverse to change. Um, as you heard, I served in uh, Harrisburg for a while, and I think there uh, it's a little bit easier because you have people coming, meeting from all across the state, whereas here, uh, you have your local fiefdoms. You have um, naturally people who works here and I have a brother who works here and so sometimes I think the best way that we can achieve uh, some of that longer term consolidation is by planning it out 10 or 20 years so that people uh, have some notice to be able to plan and can hopefully work in ways that they don't feel that they're negatively impacted by it. Um, here I'm going to get into the county budget a little bit and as I mentioned Amy here is my guru on county budget. Amy um, was formerly the budget director before when I became controller agreed to come over with me so um, we can go over these really quickly but maybe if you give the um, details sure. briefly if sure. you want to okay. join me up here. Good morning everyone my name is Amy Wise. Um, yeah, I've been in the, I just had my 20 year anniversary today, so, um, or I'm sorry, this year. <laughs> um, yeah, pleased to be with, here with all of you this morning. So the county's budget is um, comprised of um, the county's general fund includes the county's human services department, which is largely funded by federal and state grant monies, uh, and our four regional cane facilities. Um, additionally, in the county's operating budget, yeah, it was a slide before. I'm not sure how yeah, to go. I apologize. Yes. I skipped over a slide accidentally. Yeah. Just okay. Yeah. So the county, yeah, the county's operating budget, the the general fund, and then we have uh, the four additional funds in the county's operating fund is the transportation fund. Um, my former boss, Dan Honorado, implemented a drink tax in Allegheny County. Um, it is seven percent. And then there's a car rental fee, um, and those funds fund the Port Authority's local operating and capital match funds, uh, debt service fund, liquid fuels, and uh, infrastructure fund. Additionally, the county's budget includes the cap county's capital budget, which is our uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of bridges and miles and miles of roads, uh, grants and special accounts, and an agency budget. Okay. This is really significant in that um, our general fund uh, has really grown in the last in the last decade uh, under really good management. No more, no more uh, one-time uses of, of funds. We've had some really strong bond refinancings, but we're now up to just under ninety million ninety million dollars. And the rating agencies. You know, the gold standard there is to try to, to, to have a fund balance that's at least 5% of our operating revenues, and we're right now almost just shy of 7%. So the county's operating budget looks, or the fund balance looks really good there. I could just chime in. I, I think when you look at this, and I, again, I apologize because I know this is harder to see, but in the bar graph, just for perspective, when, um, when I came into office, 
this, which was also the time that the county executive, and I think he did, certainly deserves credit on this matter, when we came into office, the fund balance was $6.2 million. And that's when we had some very poor credit ratings. Um, just to put it into perspective, that fund balance was lower than many of our school districts across the county. So uh, we were really working from some um, pretty poor financial decisions that were just one-time fixes that left the county in some pretty poor fiscal health. So as I mentioned, I think fragmentation is one of the areas that we need to improve upon, but I think the thing that we should all um, feel confident in is that the county has been in very good fiscal management over the last decade. Um, and then, do I just hit this here? There we go. Our general fund um, is made up primarily of property taxes. That's our bread and butter for funding the operations of county government. That's what operates, funds our budget, the court's budget, the county manager's budget. So the largest portion of our general fund is made, uh, is funded by property taxes. The state and federal monies you see there is primarily children, youth, and families um, that is driven by decisions in the courts uh, for foster care, um, youth, um, um, juvenile probation type programs and so forth, and then our regional cane, are the four regional cane facilities. Um. I think just another perspective to think of there when we uh, mentioned the drink tax and the um, car rental tax earlier, and I will tell you that um, I'm a Democrat, but I think at that time in the state legislature, I was one of the only Democrats who was opposed to that um, because I didn't think it was fiscally responsible. But I do believe that when you look at um, the property tax part, it deserves mention, as many of you know, that in Pennsylvania, we are constrained by the uniformity clause of our state's constitution, which basically uh, leaves a county in certain ways where um, you are very constrained by what is in state law. So counties and municipalities um, who are certainly all under more difficult financial constraints these days, I think that the proposition is that either you're raising taxes, you're cutting your expenditures, and many of us need to look at ways to do things differently. And I believe that's really where this um, concept of fragmentation is so very important, because we have to do things differently, because we can't just continue to raise taxes. You can't cut much more than many of these governments already have. And I will hand it back to Amy. Um, to, we just went through the pie chart, right? Here. Yeah, let me go back to just the revenues real quick just to show. Um, yeah, just, yeah, the 2020 were a calendar year financial uh, entity, and so we really were impacted significantly with COVID, um, uh, primarily under state and charges for services. State funding was the Children, Youth, and Families program that I mentioned earlier, just uh, trying to keep um, kids at home and uh, lots of uh, human service providers. We were not having people attend those um, providers internally to provide, get services. And then charges for services, that's where Kane, our regional four centers um, received their funding and out of the, we have over 1,000 certified beds at the Kane facilities and we were down over 10%, so that revenue was down significantly. In the interest of time, I'm gonna jump ahead yeah. to the CARES Act, but you can pull that. I'm gonna switch ahead because Amy's mentioning this past year, which I think is really important for all of us. I know we have a limited amount of time, so I don't wanna to go too deeply into all this, but if you could talk on the CARES Act and the funding that the county Sure. So the county was awarded $212 million in CARES funding last year. It was spent uh, primarily for Department of Human Services. There were kids' meals in there, um, Port Authority. Uh, we put, as the drink tax just, we, the drink tax really suffered during the COVID, during 2020. So we were able to uh, get some CARES money to give to Port Authority for their local 
uh, funds. And they also had received some direct monies under CARES. Uh, grants to small businesses, 20 million. Funding for municipalities, 18 million. Test kits in order to test citizens in the county. The health department played a large role in that. Um, rent relief, 14 million. Uh, the regional asset district is funded by sales tax. Uh, the extra 1% that you all pay, we all pay in Allegheny County funds entities that receive funding under the regional asset district sales tax took a big hit in 2020. So CARES was able to supplement some of those fundings. And just mentioning on the pandemic, I think it's helpful for everyone to know. I also think this is an area where the county has done a good job. I mentioned that we have roughly 100 employees in the controller's office. The county started an incentive program where by showing vaccination records, any county employee could receive $100. And I will tell you from our individual office, that was so helpful to see which of our county employees had been vaccinated and which had not. Where I will tell you it continues to be a problem, uh, and we have been trying to pressure the county to take some different action, has been at the county jail. In those kind of congregate settings, naturally, we have a large workforce. You have a lot of corrections officers who they come in and out. Uh, and even the inmates, uh, residents at the jail, they're not there for a long time. So oftentimes, you're getting people dropped off. So that continues to be one of my areas of concern as we continue through this pandemic uh, and hopefully get to a better place in county government. Um, we do have to focus on our debt. Um, that has stabilized somewhat, but when you look at the debt, um, we have approximately $832 of debt for every county resident. So each year that has been something that our office um, has asked the administration to focus on. They have made some strides. It has been somewhat stabilized when you look at this um, backwards over previous decades, but it is still an area where the county uh, certainly needs to focus. Another area, our pension fund. Um, our pension funded status is 36%. And I'm sure, you know, we all can see that as a very, very big area of concern. But as I said earlier, unfortunately, Allegheny County doesn't get the attention on some of these matters. So you'll hear that the city of Pittsburgh has a terrible pension funded status, but you don't always hear of the work that we also need to do in Allegheny County. Um, the authorities. This is not another, uh, I think, very important point to mention. So in our office, we refer to all of these different authorities that we have through local government, some in state government, as shadow governments. Um, many of these authorities were set up years ago when there was a cap on how much governments could borrow. So governments devised these authorities so that they would not have the borrowing limits and were able to embark on different capital projects. That's no longer the law. Um, so I believe that when you look at some of the financials of authorities, where you see 2020, um, Allegheny County had an operating budget of roughly $900 million. Our big four authorities in Allegheny County, the Port Authority, the Airport Authority, Elkisan, and the Sports and Exhibition Authority combined, their budgets are larger than ours, but there's no direct way for voters to have what I like to refer to as that ballot box accountability. So a lot of what these authorities do um, happens in layers beyond which taxpayers and residents can really have the accountability that they deserve. Uh, so we've gone to court over the years to try to assert our ability to audit the authorities. Unfortunately, the court did not agree with us. So from the perspective of our office, we've taken the road that the more sunlight we can put on this, the more that we can make the public aware, uh, that's one of the best things that we can do as controller in the absence of state law that would change who has the audit ability over the authorities. Um, we focus, as I said, on transparency measures. So if you go to our website, we have some really wonderful tools. And I mentioned Jim does so many tech things. He had a big part in this. You can see in really user-friendly ways how all of your county government money is 
just spent. Uh, so if you have interest, I encourage you there. You can also look at all of the different county contracts in almost real time. So we've emphasized technology and the way that we can make sure that um, individuals have immediate access to um, your government. Lastly, to the extent that anyone's interested um, in reading some of uh, what we have found to be inspirational and um, a good guidance, there's a book, The Art of the Audit, and this is an international perspective on how important that auditing responsibility is and going to such things as performance audits in this day and age. And I think I... That is our last slide. So I wanted to um, just make sure that I had enough time to uh, respond to any questions that any of you had. Again, I'm really grateful for the invitation to come here. I know sometimes talking on finances isn't going to be the most exciting conversation, but I'm really grateful for the interest that you all have in county government. And as I said, I think it's something that's really important. Thank you. Okay, we'll take some questions now. Yeah. And while we're waiting, I should mention, we didn't expect as big of a crowd, so we didn't bring enough of these. Um, but we have our popular annual financial report, which is a great resource. We do leave these in libraries, so you should be able to see this around your communities. Um, and then also just a little booklet on the responsibilities of the county controller's office. Good morning. Good morning. Two questions. Question number one, who does have audit authority over those authorities? Oh, a funny, funny answer. Very good question. So um, the authorities by state law, it appears to be intentional to me to um, make it so that they cannot be audited. Two of them under state law are to be audited by the attorney general, which does not have an audit department. So the attorney general, and when we've communicated with the attorney general's office over this, just to basically dot all of our I's and cross our T's, they don't go in to a matter unless there has been um, evidence of wrongdoing. Right, right, right. So, so that's really limited there. The other um, two are with the auditor general. And you know the auditor general, just in terms of their responsibilities, Functionally, they don't do that so much for local governments. They're taking more of a statewide perspective and the courts and the different responsibilities that they have statewide. So, so we're very limited there. Well, then a sub-question before I get to the second question. Uh, can you fight this? <laughs> This was a hard pill for me to swallow. So when we lost this in court, um, it was roughly 2013, I believe, and we, we went to court in Allegheny County. And our lawsuit was two-part, because at that time, the county was trying to prevent us from doing performance audits. So we won on the ability to do performance audits of county government. We unfortunately lost because the court looked at that state law and said, by the state, um, code, it vests the authority to do audits in the Attorney General and the Auditor General. So I, being a hard pill to swallow, um, we have some very good attorneys in our office, and I listen to them <laughs> when they give me good advice, and they said, you know, if you fight this, you're going to lose it, and it might do more harm than good. Um, so the, I've had conversations with different individuals in state government over the years who are interested in this, uh, but being somebody who was a state representative before, I'll tell you a stat that I always think of, is that to get laws enacted in Pennsylvania, we are a slow state. Sometimes that's good for stability, but other times it has its disadvantages. Most laws, if they are successful, take approximately eight years. Uh, in Harrisburg. So um, we haven't stopped focusing on it, but we understand what we're up against, unfortunately. And, and I have even reached out to the present Auditor General, um, who's new, who, who has an audit background, which is helpful, a forensic audit background. So I still have hope. Well, you might have answered already my second question. 
My second question was, you presented us with a lot of information this morning, but I'm sure that there is a very funny incidence during your terms of office that you could share with us. <laughs> sure. And it, it may be that. <laughs> well, I'll have to think of it. Um, my, well, here, I'll tell you, from a political standpoint, I'm told, separate from office, that the most interesting story that I have is that uh, I used to be a basketball player and that I've pay, played basketball with Barack Obama before I knew who he was. <laughs> so I mentioned that I went to the University of Chicago and um, we would always play pickup basketball. And so when he gave his speech, I guess that would have been in 2004, I got a call from one of my friends and said, don't you remember that skinny guy that used to play basketball with us at the field house all the time? So that's my political one. There are a lot of funny, funny stories that I'd probably share if I weren't on TV. <laughs> I'd share, uh, let me think of one that's um, TV appropriate. Let's see. <laughs> I, I push the envelope a lot, so I, I'm at a loss to think of which ones are very funny. Jim, any thoughts? There's been a lot of things. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you one. I have Jim right here. So this is a very good one, by the way. Jim does all my social media. He's getting read already. <laughs> so Jim's a genius on all of this media stuff. But as many of you know, I feel fortunate that I'm past this age, that many people use um, the online dating apps now to meet people. Well, the way these apps, and I'm married, I have two kids, as I mentioned to you, the way that these apps are set up is that sometimes if you're using your handheld device, it automatically ports your information. Now, Jim manages my social media information. Uh, I, I'm active on it, but he makes sure that I'm not missing anything. About five years ago, one morning, I got a call from friends, and they said, are you single now? Because we have a friend that just moved back into Pittsburgh, and the application, do you remember this story? Oh, geez. <laughs> the application is called Tinder. It's a very popular app to people who are single or dating. So Jim was on the app, but he forgot that he was on the other social media monitoring our government accounts. So it took the picture of me and my family and put it on the dating app. <laughs> and when I first found it out, I thought it was one of our political adversaries. <laughs> it set me up, and I was determined to find out who the heck it was. About five hours later, Jim called. And the irony was, this was also April Fool's Day. But he did not intend it that way whatsoever. So that has to be one of the funny ones um, in this office for me. Okay. Sign of the times. <laughs> Here, hold on a second. <laughs> I'm puzzled by the comments by you and others that Pennsylvania state sales taxes revenue was down during the pandemic. Pennsylvania is one of the few states that taxes internet sales. And we see Amazon trucks all over the place. Everybody in the last year and a half has ordered a lot more online, and we're all paying significant sales tax on that. How can the state revenue on sales tax actually be down with all of this activity? Yeah, what we, what we heard, because we, we're not responsible for collecting, we're gracious enough to receive, but what we heard it was the automobile sales. So I don't know if it was those delays of the chips, that the cars were sitting there in lots, and, and so it was car sales that impacted sales tax, but I just know that we did take a hit in our sales tax uh, in 2020. And you've probably heard with that question, I know there's the discussion, um, not welcomed by many, but the discussion of adding another fee onto all of these different internet sales. Um, but I will tell you just from the perspective, in a larger sense, when we're talking about sales tax, as you probably know from, from that question, that there are many, many items in Pennsylvania that get special treatment. And that is always food and clothing, but I mean, um, I think if you, th I'm going back to my Harrisburg years by memory, um, I think smokeless tobacco might be one of them, if I recall correctly. 
um, cigars. So there are all these different exceptions that follow lobbyists, exactly. So I think the discussion tends to be like Groundhog's Day in Harrisburg. It was the same when I was there, which has now been over 10 years ago. They come up and that's, that's a point on Pennsylvania that I will also say that I think is important when we're talking about any sales tax or any government is Pennsylvania is among the bottom five states when you look at having any meaningful campaign finance measures in terms of elections. And that harms us very, very much. And uh, I have other staff members who I've worked with over the years, um, one who works on communications along with Jim, um, and he went, he followed his wife to go to Harrisburg for a little. So he worked with me, went to Harrisburg, and even having worked with me for a while, he said what he never expected was when he got to Harrisburg, how terribly influential the lobbyists are. And that was from, a, from somebody who even worked in the state house. Um, so I think when I have gone to conferences across the country, um, People who were colleagues of mine in legislatures, they couldn't believe that we didn't have limits on contributions in Pennsylvania. And when you think of different areas of inertia, and I would refer to that as inertia, and having um, more evolved kind of sales tax or just fairness there, that's something that really, really harms us and we really stick out in terms of us compared to other states in that matter. What's it going to take to uh, get to an overall metropolitan government for the greater Pittsburgh area, assuming you think that's a good idea? I, I think it is, but pardon the cliche, I do think that the devil's in the details. And so the report that tried to do that, um, and I want to say that report I think was probably from around that might have been 99, there was a big report that um, the chancellor of the University of Pittsburgh was part of. And I will tell you what I believe to be a problem with that report was, let's do it and leave all the details to later. I, I don't think you can do that type of thing. And I think that naturally, uh, I've been a resident of the city of Pittsburgh for a long time and residents of the city said, well, you can't tell us our government's going to be gone and we'll just worry about it later. So I think that for elected officials, they need to grapple with some of these more difficult questions um, and not just say, we're not going to address, for example, what happens to the pensions. The pensions remain one of the most difficult questions because a lot of the municipalities have been concerned with the city of Pittsburgh's low funded status. Well, as you saw in this presentation, the county isn't a heck of a lot different. Um, so I think that we just have to have political courage. Uh, and I think we need elected officials who are willing to have those difficult conversations. They don't get rewards for them. The public isn't going to like it. You're going to have people that fear their positions. Uh, and that's where I believe having some specificity is important, but you do have to set it out 10 years so that um, you know, somehow that we can accomplish it. But it's difficult. It's, it's difficult based on our fragmentation here. John here. So to me, the trouble with, the, trouble with uh, the government in this county is when I first came here, I thought I started, I was in Pittsburgh at Monroeville and it stopped, Allegheny County stopped at the airport. And when I went to class, everybody was not from Pittsburgh. They were from all these, and I thought, where's the Pittsburghers, you know? Right. And I, I, to me, it just would be so much better for the county if they controlled, if there was a, as one solid government for all the towns of the I, And I, I agree, certainly. I um, think, for those who aren't aware, Philadelphia is that way. So Philadelphia is a city county, which, in all other measures, is our, um, closest comparison, but not when it comes to, so my counterpart, for example, in uh, Philadelphia, she's not just the controller of the county, but she's the controller of also the city matters, of the schools, whereas here in Allegheny County, you have two separate. Um, so 
there's a way to do it. But again, I go back to thinking it's fiefdoms. You have to get over people that um, believe that you know their ability to control this small little area um, is threatened. But Chelsea, could you tell us a little bit more about Bill Peduto's decision to pull out of your uh, joint efforts yeah. between the county and the city? And, and I'll, I'll allow Amy if she had, a, Amy came to government working on that, Allegheny County government years ago working on that. Um, we didn't get a lot of information, and, and I will tell you, speaking to the uh, success of it, the retirees of the city who managed their own fund stayed with us. So the police and fire pensions wanted to stay on because they saw how successful it was. Uh, the city gave no real explanation. They claimed it was financial, but their numbers um, were not real. Uh, they peddled them as being real. So my belief was, you know, when you have people so adamant about wanting to control a financial management platform, I think they saw benefit in not having to share certain things, just like the numbers that they put out to justify wanting to move were false. We sat down with the um, firefighters and the police retirees, and we went through those numbers, but I also acknowledge that they have uh, a lot <laughs> to look at in terms of government. So I'm hopeful maybe we'll come back to it, but for now, the city's moving in their own direction. Right. Okay, uh, any other questions from Chelsea? Can you tell me what your plans are for the money that potentially could come from the infrastructure bill? Oh, okay. Uh, that's a great question. Have we done specific analysis yet on how much would come? Yeah, because that, that number is still being debated so hotly uh, at the federal level. Um, we have not done any projections in terms of Allegheny County, but um, when you look at the transportation needs. I'm sure many of you have recognized this across the county in your own communities. Um, I forget the number off the top of my head. The number, I mean, the number of roads um, that are Allegheny County owned roads, uh, the number of bridges. This goes to fragmentation because I know we could all see Allegheny County maintenance starts here and then your local community starts right after that. Um, so I can tell you that we have a significant amount of need that hasn't been funded. I would also expect, I mean, this, this would go to really the county executive, and the truth is that you don't get a lot of legislative work on council on these things, so it would be likely that the executive would submit a plan and um, the council would likely approve it. Um, I know council is very focused on trans er, the public transit needs right now because our public transit um, has certainly lost a lot of funding. So I would also expect that um, we would have, I think, rightfully some significant investment there. Now, would the authorities be getting the money directly from Washington or would that be filtered through the state or the county? Because it, since they're authorities, you said they're independent. Right. Typically, with transportation funding, it goes through the state. So okay. typically, it comes, um, and, and interestingly, in Pennsylvania, you would never think it, but when you think of um, public transit, we have roughly 90-some public transit agencies in Pennsylvania, which many people don't think of because you think we have just, you know, really a handful of larger cities, but a lot of these smaller counties have them too. So um, <clears throat> my expectation would be that it would be managed through the state. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay, Chelsea, thank you thank for coming. You. I appreciate Amy, it. Amy, thank you. Uh, great presentation. And, and, and uh, if anyone wants to date, see Jim for your profile. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, thank great. You all. <laughs> okay, well, listen, thank you, and we look forward to seeing you again. And uh, if you guys and would help us uh, put the chairs up on the racks, that would be beneficial. And we look forward to seeing you next week.